Hello Watch enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler. Whether your genre or not, the James Bond franchise has become one of the most widely known around the globe. Each adventure, whichever may be your favourite, captured an exoticism which was striking for many in the mid-20th century and brought excitement to the lives of those in a rather grey Britain. I might also note that in these times of semi-quarantine, it's more enjoyable than ever to picture the sapphire blue waters off Jamaica, a smoke-filled casino in northern France, or thick night air cut by a charging Bentley's immense Marshall headlights and the wine of its supercharger. But today's video isn't about the films or the watches which famously inhabited them. Instead, I'd like to shed light on the much less discussed world of Fleming's novels. Without making this piece too literary, it's worth commenting on the way Fleming constructed the world in which Bond lived. Unlike the arguably more subtle writing of other espionage-related novelists, Fleming filled his books with brand names and product details to create the atmosphere which is probably best portrayed in the film starring Sean Connery. By the way, I should let you know at this point that this video includes spoilers, so you've been warned. Let me give you an example. Bond doesn't smoke cigarettes. He smokes cigarettes made bespoke by Morland of Grosvenor Street from a blend of Balkan and Turkish tobacco. He doesn't use a golf ball. He uses a Dunlop 65. He doesn't drive a sports car. He drives a 1933 battleship grey Bentley, which has been coach-built to accommodate more luggage, and later an Aston Martin DB3, expressly chosen over a Jaguar for his pursuit of Auric Goldfinger's Rolls-Royce. These are both members of a string of automobiles described, which serve to entice any car enthusiast. In this way, a tangible environment was created for Bond to inhabit, and this most definitely applied to the watches of the 007 novels. More importantly, Ian Fleming used the watches of the James Bond books to portray his characters, ranging from heroes to villains, in vivid technicolour. Before I begin, please remember to like, subscribe and to hit the bell icon to always know about the latest videos. Also, head over to watchchronicler.com to find the bulk of articles, podcasts and reviews we produce. This video is sponsored by Aquastar and their iconic Deep Star dive watch, but more on that later. Let's begin with 007's taste for Rolex. Ian Fleming was a bona fide Rolex wearer and was known for owning a Rolex Explorer reference 1016. Even so, it's likely that this was not his first Rolex, considering Fleming's death in 1964, just five years after this reference was released, yet a decade since the first mention of 007 wearing a Rolex. As an alter ego, 007 was also very much a Rolex wearer too, yet as with Fleming's choice, there was absolutely zero prestige in that decision. The first mention of Bond's watch appears in 1954's Live and Let Die, when we're introduced to the agent's diving equipment in the Caribbean. This kit is then used in a decidedly exciting display of daring do, as Bond makes his way through barracuda-infested waters under the cover of darkness. At this point we still learn very little about Bond's watch, apart from the fact that it has ample water resistance and glows for legibility. In this context, the watch has to be a Rolex Oyster, but we don't actually know which one. As an aside, it would be easy to assume that the watch chosen was a Rolex Submariner, However, given that the novel was published in 1954 and researched over the preceding 18 months, I doubt that Fleming had a Rolex Submariner, a watch only released publicly in 1954 by the way, in mind for 007's use. Nevertheless, the mere mention of the Rolex name as one of the watches in the 007 books presents the rugged side of the character. This was a discreet and unpretentious watch to be used within an inch of its life, something far removed from the modern Rolex experience. Such a feeling was also given to Bond's second watch-related scene. This scene, a favourite of mine, takes place in On Her Majesty's Secret Service in 1963. In this novel, Bond travels to Pitt's Gloria in Switzerland to investigate and identify Blofeld and his accomplice Irma Bunt. Finding himself trapped in Blofeld's mountaintop lair, masquerading as a health clinic, Bond must fight his way out. With his razor in his left hand and his Rolex wrapped around his right hand as a knuckle duster, he proceeds to bludgeon a guard out of action. Bond later states that he'll probably buy another Rolex due to this very toughness. Through these examples, we can see the durability which the Rolex name commanded in period, as it would be more than fair to say, these watches were not chosen for brand prestige. This was first apparent in Bond's blasé attitude to buying another, but also in his clear distaste for obviously ostentatious appearances. After all, Fleming makes a point of his black lighter and gunmetal cigarette case in 1953's Casino Royale, whilst his disapproval of large tie knots is revealed in From Russia With Love in 1957. Next we move to Hugo Drax and his portrayal of wealth. Hugo Drax in the 1955 novel Moonraker is a thoroughly different character in the novels than in the 1979 movie of the same name. Living as a German soldier and saboteur during the Second World War, he's disfigured in a botched attack on a British base. Feigning amnesia, Drax is misidentified as a wounded British soldier and becomes Hugo Drax, a successful businessman, philanthropist and agent of the USSR, most importantly. 
First introduced to the reader as a cheat in the fictional London gambling club, Blades, Drax is presented as a crass, impolite brute with immensely deep pockets. He's also described as being a truly hideous man to behold, all contributing to a thoroughly unpleasant image for the reader. Nevertheless, until the final stages of the novel, perhaps Fleming's best, Drax remains a philanthropist providing Britain with a cutting-edge nuclear missile. As such, his choice of watch needed to be respectable, but witheringly expensive. With this picture in mind, Fleming used his watch as a final touch. By contrast to Bond's functional, understated choice, Drax wears a plain gold Patek Philippe on a black leather strap. This selection presents the perfect background to a character as a man whose primary concern is displaying his wealth and status as a means of hiding his true intentions. Of course, we'll never know which Patek Philippe Fleming had in mind, but I'd hazard a guess that a post-war Calatrava would be the best choice for this character and the description provided. If you're enjoying this video, I suspect that dive watches and the history of subaquatic exploration will be of interest, including the work of Jacques Cousteau. Following his joint invention of the Aqualung in 1943 with Émile Gagnon, Cousteau's influence on many of our imaginations came with episodes of The Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau, appearing from 1966 to 76 in its first run. What few may know, however, is that the watch seen in the first episode of this hugely influential series was the Aquastar Deep Star, perhaps the most important diving chronograph of all time, usable down to 100 metres, and with the provision to calculate necessary decompression for consecutive dives. Nevertheless, by the 21st century, the brand had all but disappeared from the diving scene. However, in 2020, under the new ownership of the Synchron Group, the company that brought back icons like the Doxa Sub in the early 2000s, Aquadive and also the Isofrain and Tropic Straps, Aquastar is back with the brand new Deep Star, with modern specifications and classical looks. Watch our review to find out more, or head over to aquastar.ch to get your own piece of dive watch history. Next we have Tiffany Case, a rather unusual female character in one of Fleming's potentially weaker novels. In the 1956 novel Diamonds Are Forever, Bond goes up against the Spangled Mob, a major diamond smuggling ring in America. On this journey he meets Tiffany Case, a lady with a less than luxurious background in brothel ownership. Even so, named after the shop from which her deceased father bought perfume for her mother, there is more than a little luxury to this lover of Bond's. Incidentally, she is the only female character to whom Fleming assigns a watch, a curious detail which sets her aside as a particularly important individual. The watch is described as a small square Cartier watch with a black strap. Of course, the most obvious choice of model would be the unmistakable and truly stunning Cartier tank. With a youthful simplicity and a much more elegant demeanour than the Rolex worn by Bond, and incidentally a much older design, the tank seems a delightful choice for a lady involved in a landscape of casinos and diamonds. One also has to remember that in 1956, the tank was a purely precious metal luxury watch without affordable counterparts in the brand's catalogue, so the appearance was quite different in period to what we might see today as a fairly common watch worn by rather a lot of people. Next we have Grant, a complicated man with a complicated watch, but also a man who is perhaps the most brutal killer in any of these novels. Appearing from the very beginning of From Russia With Love, Grant was an unusual villain. Originally a Briton with severe psychiatric problems, he was enlisted to Smesh as a ferociously brutal assassin. Within the first few pages, we're introduced to this mysterious man lying naked on his face next to a swimming pool. Beside him rests a money clip stuffed with banknotes, a gold Dunhill lighter, and a gold Fabergé cigarette case, all loot from previous kills. Most importantly for this video, a watch is also mentioned. It's described as a bulky gold wristwatch on a well-used brown crocodile strap. Most importantly, the description continues as the most complete of all the watches in the 007 books. Fleming continues, It was a Gérard Perigord model designed for people who like gadgets, and it had a sweep second hand, and two little windows in the phase to tell the day of the month, and the month, and the phase of the moon. From this, we can be sure that Grant wore a gold triple calendar Gérard Perigot. Curiously though, I've been unable to find any images of a solid gold model with a moon phase and triple calendar from the aforementioned brand in period, but I can only assume that such a watch did exist. With the aforementioned description, the choice of watch is an interesting one. In personality, as in profession, Grant is presented as a brute, and yet his watch, stolen from a victim, is a very elegant piece. The result is an ambiguous feeling, and the sense that Grant is a patchwork of influences boiled together into one vile man, a murderer in regional Britain, a defector in Berlin, and a torturer and hitman for the Soviet Union. Finally, we have Giuseppe Patacci, a fleeting character you could say in the franchise, but one which is given quite a lot of description. If you're familiar with the film adaptations of 007, Giuseppe Patacci may be an unfamiliar name. 
However, his role in 1961's Thunderball is roughly that of Angelo Palazzi, masquerading as Francois de Val, that is, in the film adaptation. This character commandeers a British bomber in order to deliver its nuclear bombs to Emilio Largo, and by extension, Spectre. The other distinction between the two characters is the aircraft stolen, an Avro Vulcan appears in the film, whilst the novel presents the fictional Villiers Vindicator. Whilst undeniably short-lived and never a direct opponent for Bond, given that he's murdered very early on in the book, Patacci's watch is one of the most memorable. Patacci is shown to us as a Second World War Italian pilot whose only real aim in life is to acquire enough wealth to enjoy an easy life and a Maserati 3500 GT in dark blue. He is described as owning a couple of gold cigarette cases, plenty of sharp clothes, and a white convertible Lancia Gran Turismo, which I presume would be a Lancia Flaminia GT. And so the timepiece chosen for this character is a very fitting one, it must be said. A solid gold Rolex Oyster Perpetual chronometer on a flexible gold bracelet. In this choice is Patachi's lavish taste, but also his enjoyment of accuracy in aviation and motor racing, which is mentioned briefly. Amusingly, the selection of a gold Rolex also displays that, all things considered, Patachi is actually rather similar to Bond, with the key distinction of an entirely self-serving personality. Overall, Ian Fleming's Bond novels are, for many, the reference for exciting and adventurous books about espionage. By the same token, James Bond and his general image, with the possible exception of George Smiley, is just what comes to mind when one thinks of a spy. However, through the watches worn by his character and by others in the franchise, we're given a much deeper insight into what Ian Fleming pictured when he put pen to paper. Which was your favourite watch to appear in the 007 franchise? If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like, share and subscribe to always catch the latest content from Watch Chronicler. Thank you very much for watching. This is Armon from watchchronicler.com. Out.